Hello and welcome to Home-Based Behavioral Supports for Distance Learning. My name is Andrea Yepes and I am a school psychologist and behavior specialist with Azusa Unified School District. This presentation is being offered tonight through the Azusa Parent Learning Network and will be available recorded in both English and Spanish after the presentation. Tonight we will be talking about some simple behavioral strategies that you can do at home to help support your student with distance learning. We'll start by talking about establishing routines, setting behavioral expectations, how to prompt and reinforce appropriate behaviors, as well as how we can set up the environment for them to be successful. Before we dive in, I wanna provide you with a quick note on resources. I'm going to be sharing a link to a Google Drive folder at the end of this presentation that has all the resources that I'm gonna be referencing today. There's a folder in English as well as one in Spanish that you can refer to if you like any of the resources that we discussed tonight. There's also a uh, handout of the slides, both in English and Spanish, again, so you can refer back to them if you'd like. A couple ways that you can utilize these resources, you can print them. If you don't have access to a printer, I encourage you to reach out to your student's teacher or school team to help support you with printing of any of these resources. You can also download them. I have a lot of families that I work with that like to download some of these resources and project them on their student's screen as they're maybe getting ready in the morning, a visual of their morning routine. There's a couple different options that we'll go through today that um, will be well suited for downloading and projecting. Or you can also make your own using these as a reference. Um, I tried to include quite a few options in there uh, for different age groups, but some of them may not quite suit your family's needs. So please feel free to modify them and adjust them to, to fit your household's needs. All of these supports that I'm going to be reviewing with you tonight are considered universal supports. Now what that means is these supports are applicable for all students and all learners. Uh, students of different ages, as well as students from our general education and our special education population. For any of you that have students that are a part of our special education program, they may benefit from some more individualized or intensive supports that are already outlined in their IEPs. So if you'd like more information or more details on any of those supports, I encourage you to reach out to your student's case carrier for more details. Routines are really essential to all of us. We all follow routines and they're helpful in reducing anxiety, helping us to anticipate upcoming events and transitions, and they help to promote smooth transitions. There's a couple different ways that we can um, establish and communicate routines with our students. Um, one of them is a visual schedule. We all use visual schedules every day. A calendar is an example of a visual schedule. Um, for our school age students, we oftentimes use a more simplified or daily visual schedule. And especially for our younger learners or our learners that don't have um, full grasp of their reading skills just yet, we might use a visual schedule that has a picture or icon to um, complement the text that re represents the um, task or activity at hand. Um, for some of our older learners, those icons or pictures may not be as necessary but that's going to be dependent on your student's level and their needs. Um, for our younger learners, I do want to make a comment that those pictures are really helpful. And we wanna make sure that we're keeping the text along with the pictures, because even if they're not um, reading just yet, having them paired together and rehearsing it really helps with those pre-reading skills and helps our students to develop that uh, skill over time. So we wanna make sure that we're not just using pictures, that we have both text and pictures to help support that reading development. Another option to communicate a routine or schedule to your child or student is using a checklist. This option is similar to a visual schedule. Um, however, it is more geared towards our older students that are doing a little bit more self-management and can um, manage their time and their tasks a little bit more independently. So um, a checklist can be utilized in a sequential way, like a visual schedule where one task has to come after the next and so on. Um, for that option, uh, typically using a numbered checklist is best, or you can also do just a bulleted checklist for your students if they have the freedom to 
um, work in their own order as long as they're getting tasks done in a set amount of time. Um, it's really helpful to build this together with your student. If they're an older student, it helps them to take some control and get some independence in managing their time. Now, anytime that we start a new routine, whether it be with a visual schedule or a checklist, we wanna make sure that we are um, going over it at first with our students so they understand the expectations, so they're familiar with it. Um, and also when we are anticipating a transition, so maybe between one activity and the next, or as they're wrapping up a task on that checklist, we'll wanna be in the area and help prompt them through to the next task. Um, we want them to be successful. We wanna support them the first time or two so that it becomes more natural to them. And the goal is to date ourselves out so they can start to um, facilitate their schedule independently. Another great option for routines for our students and typically our students that need a little bit more prompting is using a first then contingency. Um, contingency simply means dependent. So one thing is dependent on the other, much like our visual schedule where you have to complete one task before moving on to the next. A first then contingency is also known as grandma's rule. And the reason it is called that is because you might hear a grandma or a caregiver say, first you have to have your dinner before you can have your dessert. And we all know the trick with that is if we don't eat our dinner, we don't get that dessert. So that's kind of why um, we call it a contingency and we phrase it as grandma's rule. Contingencies like this are uh, really best supported with using a visual. Um, I have a simple visual, a picture will come up in just a moment, but one that I have here is a first then board. And this one is laminated. It's gonna be in the Google Drive folder if you'd like to download it or print it. But I like to use a laminated copy because I can use a dry erase marker and I can write the task and we can wipe it off and we can do it again when we need to do another uh, first then prompt. And uh, you can use it multiple times. You can use it between activities. And when we're ready to prompt our student, we can even just point to it as a reminder. Um, next, we also have timers and alarms as a really great resource for our students. Um, as adults, we use timers and alarms all the time. For instance, I you know, set my alarm on my phone and I also use timers when I'm cooking, um, but I'm guilty of picking up my phone to set an alarm or timer and getting distracted by another notification. So we wanna keep that in mind when we're uh, helping our students utilize timers and alarms that we're not adding additional distraction for them. In the school setting, we always use timers and alarms in the sense that we have a school bell system to alert them when there's a transition or a change coming. And that's probably not happening right now in your living rooms or in your homes with distance learning. So um, there is a fun little timer that I've used in the school setting, this one here. It's just a really simple kitchen timer, only three buttons there. Um, so that, again, limiting the distraction that it could pose for our students. And I like that these ones are bright, so I don't lose them um, in my various paperwork. But these are really cheap on Amazon, great option. I've also found really simple, fun options at just like the 99 cent store, if that's something that's of interest to you. There are also great electronic options, such as Google. You can just do a Google search for the set amount of time and specify timer, and it'll pop up right there on the search results. And it's just in black and white, so it's not too flash and distracting. There's also YouTube options that, again, caution for um, potential distraction. Uh, if you know your student and they're a YouTube fan, this may not be a good option, um, but they have timer options on there where you can search the amount of time and they'll have fun different backgrounds or music. I do have quite a few parents that I uh, speak with that utilize this in the morning so that their student has a visual uh, timer to let them know when it's time to join their class. Here is a copy or an example of a visual schedule. This example actually comes directly from that Google Drive folder that I mentioned, and it's an AM routine. It's probably for one of our uh, younger groups of students because we do have those pictures there. Um, and it's a pretty simplified uh, example, but this is available to you along with many other uh, options. So please take a look at that if that's of interest to you. And then also here's that first then that I just referenced. This is also in that Google Drive folder. Here's just another example of a visual schedule that's uh, looking at a routine for elementary. 
which is our younger students, as well as secondary, which is our middle school and high school students. This also comes from the Google Drive folder, and I'll tell you more about that in just a second. But if you look at the examples for each activity, on the secondary side, you're gonna see there's a little more independence built in because we're trying to help our students do a little bit more independent um, work for themselves and make some decisions in their schedule. This example is actually coming from a handout that's in the drive. It is called Supporting Parents with PBIS at Home. It's available in both English and Spanish. It covers both or it covers all of the topics that we're gonna be covering today. And it also has some additional examples. So it's a really great tool just for more information to take a look at. And PBIS, before I get carried away, is Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. It's the framework that we use to support uh, positive behaviors all around our district. So um, students are very familiar with the format of um, PBIS. So this is gonna be a really helpful tool for you at home during distance learning. Expectations. Now, when we're setting up routines with our students, we wanna make sure that we're being really clear about the expectations that are within each task or each activity. So in order to set up clear, communicable um, behavioral expectations, we wanna make sure that we're stating them explicitly, we're modeling them, and we're reinforcing them for our students. When we say explicitly stated, that means that we're using clear language to tell our student what something means. So for example, in the brick and mortar school setting, students are used to raising their hand and waiting in their seat like this, right? And now in this new virtual platform, there's this handy little button on the bottom of the screen that says raise hand. And that's primarily what a lot of our teachers are using to uh, facilitate raised hands and answering questions in class. So that's kind of a new learning uh, opportunity for our students in this environment. So the first time around, um, teachers are telling our students you know, Johnny, if you have a question or want to share something, please uh, raise your hand on this button and uh, wait quietly on mute until I call on you. So that's kind of a new learning curve for our students. We wanna make sure that we're very clear with our words as to what the expectation is. And then next, we wanna make sure we model it. Not only are we telling them what it means, but we're gonna show them what it means. And by that, we might uh, physically show Johnny, if I'm a teacher, I've seen a lot of teachers that share their screen and uh, model for students where that button is and they click it. As a parent, you could also be near them and you could facilitate it uh, using their mouse and click the button and model that we're waiting there quietly with our, uh, our mic muted and not interrupting the class. Lastly, we wanna make sure that we're always reinforcing those positive behaviors or when they're meeting those behavior expectations. Reinforcement simply means increasing a behavior. So um, when we catch our students being good or doing something that is expected, we wanna make sure that we acknowledge that. Um, we'll talk more about reinforcement a little later on, but for now, we just wanna make sure that we're catching them being good and acknowledging those positive behaviors. This example here, again, comes from that PBIS at home handout. And you'll see on the left-hand side, be respectful, be responsible, and be safe. These are the behavioral expectations that we're gonna try and make really explicit for our students. And across the top, you'll see the various uh, settings. So in the virtual classroom, mealtime and bedtime. And you'll notice that in different environments, there's different behavioral expectations. And that's something that's really important to note when we're dealing with distance learning for our students, because this is a very confusing time. Typically, home has a set amount of expectations and school has a little bit different expectations. Um, there might be a little bit more structure at school or you know, it's not necessarily as much of a, a leisure or social time at school, um, but there's different expectations and there's different expectations with different people as well. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're acknowledging that while our students are at home, they're having to try and understand the blend of their home expectations and their school expectations. And it's new for everyone. So we wanna make sure that setting them up for success we uh, make sure that the new expectations are explicitly stated. We're providing opportunities to model it and we're reinforcing them when they're, when they're doing a good job. We wanna make sure that we're really supporting them with this process. Um, just briefly, I wanna to touch on these examples for the virtual classroom 
but in order to be respectful, we want our students to know that um, that means keeping background noise to a minimum while engaged in a lesson. Another that we have learned throughout our time with distance learning is muting our mic when not speaking, um, because that's always a, a daily thing that we review with students. It always happens, someone's unmuted or is having trouble with it. So we wanna make sure that we're reinforcing that. Another uh, be responsible means do your best work, turn in your homework when it's due. And to add one more, we're uh, seeing that logging in and logging off on time is another important way that we are being responsible as students. Lastly, uh, being safe means keeping your open drink away from your computer keyboard. It also means that we are leaving our device on a flat surface. We're not carrying it around doing a field trip. We don't want anyone to trip. We don't want any damages that are going to um, make connecting for a class difficult. We want it to be um, safe and easy to access class time. Um, this, as I mentioned, actually comes from that PBIS at home handout. I'm not going to review mealtime or bedtime because that is um, gonna be a little bit more specific to your home and your, uh, your expectations and your needs within your family. But I do encourage you to take a look at this and see if it would be something that's helpful. Um, again, please feel free to make any modifications that are necessary for you to make it work for your household. Now, I did not share earlier, but there is one exception to the universal supports that I mentioned. Uh, today, behavior contracts that we're gonna discuss is actually considered a targeted support. And what that means is it is not intended for all students. Not all students are gonna require this level of support. This is for our students that have a specific behavioral struggle. So something maybe like attendance or completing homework or blurting. Um, there's a variety of different behaviors you could target here, but it is intended for students who are not responding to those universal supports. Um, it's really important to note that we want to exhaust those uh, universal supports to make sure that we're giving students opportunity to uh, meet these expectations mostly independently, but some of our students may require a little additional support and a behavior contract is a really great way to go. I'm gonna review with you just briefly a couple of the basics of what a behavior contract entails, and then we'll go through an example together. Um, the example you'll find in your um, Google Drive folder when you have a chance to take a look. So contract basics, it's always going to outline a behavioral expectation, whatever it is that we're targeting. I like to keep it simple and stick with just one. Um, if we are looking at a host of things all at once, you probably wanna prioritize and address one at a time so it's not overwhelming for your student and not overwhelming for yourself to try and manage all of them at once. Um, so if we're outlining a specific behavioral struggle, we wanna make sure that it's stated in clear and measurable terms. We want it to be really clear to both parties, yourself and your student, what it is that you're looking for. Um, we wanna make sure that it's measurable. We're not using words like good. We're not saying Sally's gonna have a good day because my definition of good may be very different from Sally's. And we wanna make sure that um, we both understand what the expectation is and we have all the tools we need to meet that goal. We also wanna make sure that it's phrased positively. So we wanna tell our student what to do, what is the expectation rather than what not to do. Um, it's something that they can work towards. So an example might be, Johnny will wait quietly to be called on rather than Johnny will not blurt out. Next, another very important piece of the contract is we wanna tell our students what can be earned and when. Uh, we all uh, need a little motivation when we're working on our goals and we wanna make sure that we are providing that for our students. We wanna be very clear um, what it is that they can earn and when so that they are an active participant in this. Um, we'll talk more, like I mentioned, about reinforcement later so that we can help determine what is an appropriate reinforcer and an appropriate amount. But for now, um, we'll just talk about that in the sense of something that is motivating for our students and something that increases that behavior. An example might be that Johnny will earn 30 minutes of screen time at the end of each day that he meets his goal. Here is the example that I promised. As you see on the left, we have um, the English version and on the right in Spanish. Um, these are both available to you in the Google Drive folder. And the template that you'll see, it starts with a blank template and at the later pages, you'll see these pre-filled examples for your reference. 
Now, I wanted to walk you through this one so you have a little bit more information if you feel that this is an appropriate um, step for you and your child or your student. So I just wanna make sure you have all the tools you need. This contract at the top you can see is between Skyla and her dad. They have a date when it begins, April 10th, and they also have a date to review it. Um, it's a good idea to have a review date in mind so that if she's meeting her goal, you guys might be able to target something new if needed, or you might be able to um, stop having such an intensive support. As you can see here, the goal is also, um, that's our behavioral expectation that we mentioned. It's a really well-written one. Skyla will get to school on time. It's really simple, it's really clear, it's measurable, and it's stated positively. Um, an optional piece for behavior contracts is strategies. It is optional, but I definitely think it's worthwhile. Um, strategies are really helpful because you can help your student identify ways that they can help themselves be more successful. And as you see on number two, this one actually outlines how dad or parent or guardian might be able to help um, support her as well, or your student as well. So um, whenever you are going to utilize a behavior contract with your student, my recommendation is that you sit down with the template, the blank template, and you develop it together. It's really important that you have their buy-in. Um, they're going to be much more motivated if they can help determine what the goal is, and they're going to be more aware of their strategies if you uh, go through them together first before expecting them to utilize them. Additionally, if they can give you some information about what would be reinforcing for them, that's gonna be really helpful as well to get that motivation piece. Now, um, I definitely recommend if you're going to be using a behavior contract with your child, you should be printing it out or making a second copy, whichever you prefer. Um, and leaving it in a space that's accessible to both you and your student so you can reference it. Um, it's a great way to prompt them if they're maybe having a little bit of a difficult day. You might say, hey, check out your strategies, or you might just simply uh, point to the page as a reminder that that's what they're working on. Um, so definitely a printed copy available is going to be really helpful for both you and your student with the success of the behavior contract. Now, the last piece of a behavior contract that I want to spend some time on is this section called rewards and consequences. Um, rewards and consequences is also known as the what and the when that we referenced previously. And rewards is also known as reinforcement. So something that increases behavior and it helps with that motivation. Uh, the parent here is using a little bit more complicated of a system, not a bad one to use, but does have a little bit more involved. For instance, this dad says that he will put a check mark on the dry erase board when Skyla meets a goal or uses one of her strategies. And after 10 check marks, she earns 30 extra minutes of screen time. Um, for a first time behavior contract, uh, my recommendation is typically to keep it really simple. Um, if Skyla is having a hard time getting to school every day, and she's starting at zero days out of the week on time, we may want to do something a little bit more immediate. We may want to do a daily schedule, uh, meaning that if Skyla gets to school on time on the, in the morning, that she'll earn access to her screen time that evening. And each day she'll have that opportunity. Um, now, if Skyla is doing a little bit better than that and she's able to get to school, you know, two to three, maybe four days out of the week, we want to set that goal a little higher. And maybe we can um, extend that a little bit and have her wait for the reinforcement until the end of the week. Um, again, that's going to be dependent upon where your student's at and what your goal is. But we wanna make sure that it's attainable for our student. We wanna make sure that that reinforcement matches the efforts that they're um, putting in to reach this goal. So um, either way, a daily or a weekly is going to be a great option. You're also welcome to use this uh, other ratio option there, but it is a little bit more complicated. It takes a little bit more um, time to manage checking those behaviors. For parents that are at work, it may be easier just to be able to check at the end of the day, uh, one and done. So definitely all options for you. Uh, the last point here is consequences. And I wanna pause before reviewing the specific consequence that they have listed because um, research shows us time and time again that reinforcement or positive strategies are much more um, effective and longer lasting than any consequence or punishment strategies. So it is tried and true that 
we uh, use the PBIS model in our school districts because it's evidence-based. Um, I feel like whenever we list our consequences separately, we tend to add an additional consequence outside of the natural consequence. Um, so for instance, this parent uh, put the consequence that if she is late to school, she will have no phone privileges that night. And if she doesn't use her strategy, she'll be grounded the next weekend. Um, it's a slippery slope when we start identifying consequences separately, because then we add on something again, outside of that natural consequence. And we know that punishment procedures and consequence procedures are not as effective. Um, when I say natural consequence, what that means is if Skyla is meeting her goal and earning her reinforcer, she's good. But if Skyla is not meeting her goal, the natural consequence is simply that she doesn't earn that predetermined reinforcer. So that is a choice that um, Skyla is making or um, somewhere that maybe we might want to relook at the goal and see if it's um, really an attainable goal and see that she has appropriate strategies to help support her. Um, but my caution to you is please, um, if you're going to utilize that consequence section, please ensure that it is a natural consequence so that it is going to be effective for your student and not overly punitive. Um, thank you for your time. We will have a part two to review the remaining slides on Wednesday, March 17th from 5.30 to 6.15 p.m. As promised, here is the uh, resources. Uh, here's the Google Drive folder. So please feel free to take a look at that and utilize any of those resources. And hopefully we'll see you on the 17th. Thank you. Bye-bye.